this is Peninsula TV's coverage of the 47th Annual Progress Seminar. The yearly event happened from April 8th through the 10th. The Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce invited people from the county government, local business, and community leaders for a weekend retreat in Monterey to meet on community issues during keynote events and breakout sessions. The breakout sessions included Highway 101 Corridor, ensuring our economic engine keeps moving, middle class in transition from pickup trucks to Teslas, connecting our communities, housing options for all, reflecting the community we serve, our next generation steps up. And now on to coverage from the 2016 Progress Seminar. So now it's uh, once again my pleasure to introduce to you Mark Simon, who is going to uh, be the moderator for today's really super exciting panel. Uh, we got some great guests here that Mark will introduce. But Mark really needs no introduction, but as you know, he joined uh, Sam Trans in 2004 as the Director of Communications. He's now serving as Senior Advisor and Strategist to Jim Hartnett. Prior to that, he uh, spent a long, long time in the newspaper business covering politics, does a television show with Peninsula TV, really keeps up on the issues for San Mateo County. And so please welcome Mark Simon. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Um, we have a terrific panel today. Uh, their bios, extensive bios, are in your program, so I'm not going to go at too late. Why don't you folks just come on up here? Uh, and we'll introduce them, we'll get started. Um, there is a, going to be probably 100 years of accumulated political experience uh, on this stage, and that's just County South. <laughs> True. Um, Come on, come on. Uh, I'm gonna get mics first. Well, let me introduce Sal first, Sal Russo. Uh, as, as you know from your program, organized the Tea Party Express to bring focus and influence to the grassroots Tea Party movement, which is a lot like bringing focus to the Marx Brothers. Um, <laughs> Sal, and I, uh, Sal and I first met in 1979 in a special election to replace the late Leo Ryan that was run, uh, won by a Republican member of the Board of Supervisors back when we had those. Yeah. A uh, named Bill Royer. And by the way, is Jim Hartnett's uncle. So it's a reunion of sorts for, uh, for Bill and for Sal. Carla Marinucci. Uh, Carla is a reporter for Politico, uh, covers the California scene called California Playbook. Uh, I sat near Carla uh, when we covered politics for the Chronicle. And uh, she left. Um, several months ago to start at Politico, and I understand that her cubicle has been declared a super fun cleanup site. Uh, Carla's one of those people who never quite threw anything away. Um, Bill Whalen from the Hoover Institution, uh, whose experience in mainstream Republican politics uh, puts him somewhere on the liberal wing of the Hoover Institution. Um, he's an experienced and uh, well thought, a thoughtful commentator whose even-handedness makes everybody nervous. And then last but not least, uh, my partner Kevin uh, Mullen, who uh, co-hosts the game with me and I, uh, insists on doing the show with me even though I'm convinced it's just bad for his career. Um, I, I want to tell you there is a reporter present. Carla never stops working, so she's going to want to use some of the comments from folks here in her uh, her daily blog called uh, California Playbook, which I urge, uh, urge you adamantly to get. It, it brings you up to date on what's happening in California. She calls from countless publications herself and then does her own original reporting, and nobody works harder than Carla. Um, let's get started. Let's just work our way around here. Start with the, uh, the question. I feel like that scene in The Godfather. How did things get this way? <laughs> um, I, I don't understand. Give us your thoughts about a presidential campaign that is beyond imagination. I mean, I don't think any of us could have thought that a presidential campaign would be like this one this year, Bill. Yeah, so uh, a year ago, I was sitting in Washington, D.C. at an event. Uh, the Hoover Institution was running in Washington. And uh, a donor sitting at the table with me did the one thing which I hate, which is he passed around a napkin. 
and said, please write down on this napkin the name of the Republican nominee. And I asked him after he did so to mail me the napkin a year later so that I could A, burn it, uh, plus B, just see how badly we all got it. And I think of the 12 names on that uh, napkin, I think there were about 10 separate candidates, not a one of whom was Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or John Kasich. <laughs> Uh, so um, all of us supposedly bright minds batted a perfect 0 for 17. We had 17 possible guesses, and we got it all wrong. Uh, on a separate napkin, we wrote down uh, how early Bernie Sanders would be out of the race. And I think everybody wrote March 1st, Super Tuesday, and we got that wrong as well. So the question is, why did we get it wrong? And I think um, there's a simple answer, and I will try not to filibuster here. The simple answer is that um, 2016 is an upside down election and that in many respects, Democrats are running like Republicans, Republicans are running like Democrats in this regard. There's a pattern to how Republicans go about their presidential business. It tends, the nominee tends to be the last guy standing uh, who didn't get the nomination. He goes into the next cycle with the most money, best organization, and a narrative that it's usually because he's in his, last, in his 60s or 70s. It's his last hurrah. This worked for Ronald Reagan in 1980. It worked for George H.W. Bush in 88, who lost to Reagan. Bob Dole lost to Bush in 88. He got the nomination in 96. The pattern breaks with Bush W. in 2000, but then it picks right up with McCain in 2008, Romney 2012, and the pattern breaks in 2016. You have Republicans lost in that respect. On the Democratic side, meanwhile, their nominee in waiting is who? A lady who will turn 69 years old a month before the election who was the runner-up the last time the Democrats had a contentious uh, primary, who was running her last campaign, it's her last hurrah. So in some ways, the, Democratic, the Democrats are operating like Republicans and vice versa. But the two parties are in kind of a very perilous state when you think about it. For the Republicans, the parts are larger than the sum. The Republicans have record numbers of state lawmakers, of senators and congressmen in Washington, 30 governors but they have a terrible time running a national election, finding a national person to get behind. The Democrats have the opposite problem. The sum is larger than the parts in that they are very good at finding one person to run nationally, be it Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, but the party is kind of cored out when you look down toward governors and senators and congressmen. If Hillary Clinton weren't running, if Hillary Clinton were to run into legal trouble, I know Democrats in Manhattan who think Jerry Brown would be the perfect <laughs> solution, so this suggests they maybe aren't, don't have the deepest bench, if you will. So. I think to get to the question of why the volatility, why the craziness, it's because the two parties, when you look at them, just aren't that strong. Kevin, we have a 74-year-old who's winning the youth vote. <laughs> uh, we have uh, two candidates. In my office. <laughs> we have two candidates, uh, one who has no experience and one who has virtually no experience. It's just a crazy year. Yeah. Uh, it is a crazy year. Uh, I think just on the Republican side, I think we underestimated the power of having a global brand. I mean, politics is a name ID business, and Donald Trump started out with a certain number, has been able to somehow maintain that um, with, without regard to uh, you know, saying things that other politicians um, would regret and, and quickly be out of the race. So he's had this sort of ability to sustain. We're not sure your microphone is on. Your microphone didn't get turned on. It's a shame. He's been brilliant. That's right, you didn't miss any of <laughs> that. You really didn't miss anything. <laughs> I'm still trying to wake up. So, um, so Trump has this global brand, has been able to maintain um, some level of popularity throughout this process. It, it defies logic uh, for somebody like me. Uh, what I would say, though, is I think uh, on both sides, um, the extremes are being energized. But there's also a large disaffected middle that is just frustrated with politics as usual, the status quo, the establishment, what have you. So this year is actually sort of tailor-made for a volatile year, um, given, given um, the Sanders and Trump uh, phenomenon. Where this all goes, I know we'll get into it over the next hour, but no, I've never seen anything like this. And I think uh, the political class uh, will be digesting this and analyzing this for some time to come, but we can't ignore the level of angst and anger at what is perceived as the status quo. So there are large groups of large swaths of voters looking for something very, very different, and Sanders and Trump are uh, giving voice to that. Well, they're certainly different. So, uh, well, I'm not 
quite experienced with 100 years, but <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting close, we dedicated this a statue to President Reagan in the state capitol a few months ago. And um, Mrs. Reagan was obviously ill and she couldn't make it. But she sent me a little note and said, do you realize that it'll be 50 years in December that we came to Sacramento? So it's not quite 100, but it's 50. When I, I asked Joanne Drake, her chief of staff, I said, did she send that to me as an insult or was that? <laughs> but the one advantage of being around for so long is you realize that as unique we always think the elections are, they're not quite so unique. That what we're seeing in, in 2016, for which all of us, including me, sometimes say, have you ever seen anything like this before? Well, it, well the truth is we have. <clears throat> Politics has these recurring cycles. And, and, I'll, and I'll point a couple of them. Unfortunately, I have to reveal one of the bad chapters of my life that I try to hide. And that is when I went down to Dallas, Texas to work for Ross Perot. Uh, and made permanent enemies a lot of my Bush friends. Um, there's some common elements that you see that bring out a Donald Trump or a um, or Ross Perot, <clears throat> and sometimes they're not even you know they're not businessmen like those two. In 1976, we had Watergate, the oil embargo, uh, we had stagflation, and we had a lot of unhappiness with it in, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And so the Democrats had, I would say, there today's Donald Trump, a seg former segregationist governor of Alabama, George Wallace, who was doing really well on the polls. Uh, and the Democrats were all panicked. And the Democrats had their establishment candidates, Scoop Jackson, uh, Mo Udall, Maria Shriver's dad, Sergeant Shriver. Uh, they had to stop Trump. And then there was a guy that was running that kind of more like the Ted Cruz in this campaign that nobody particularly liked, this obscure peanut farmer from Georgia named Jimmy Carter, who had no support. When Jimmy Carter came to Sac Sacramento for his first press conference in the governor's press conference room, zero, not one reporter showed up. I mean, nobody took him seriously at all. The serious candidates were all the Washington establishments. But as the campaign wore on, uh, the establishment finally, and, and Carter kept winning primaries, they got behind somebody that nobody in Washington, D.C. wanted. Nobody wanted Jimmy Carter, but he was kind of the default as a way to stop George Wallace. But Carter's campaign was an anti-Washington campaign. It's the same kind of a thread that we see uh, with uh, Donald Trump. And on the Republican side, we had President Jerry Ford. And for Californians who knew that Ronald Reagan actually was competent to run something, because he'd been governor for eight years, for the rest of the country, Ronald Reagan was, oh my God, this actor, he reads lines, he doesn't know anything, he's a big dummy. Uh, he challenged President Ford in the primary, and of course we got all the way to the convention and only 100 votes short. So there was another example, I mean, this campaign 80 was totally different, but in 76, he was a protest candidate, uh, very different than his 80 candidates, candidacy. And then in 92, pro, we had, George Bush had, uh, the, the big problem, remember, there was a lot of consumer dissatisfaction. And I thought what encapsulated the Bush campaign, he went to this show, this industrial show and saw a grocery scanner. Now, it ended up being an updated grocery scanner, but he, he did his, oh, gee whiz, kind of a thing. <laughs> and so the press pounced on it, that this guy is so out of touch, he doesn't even know what a grocery scanner is. I mean, so Bush was in, you know, from the height of liberating Kuwait to the depths of people saying, what are you going to do for me now? And the Democrats had uh, Bill Clinton. There was, what they call him, I forgot they call him the seven midgets or something like that. Seven dwarfs. Because yeah. at the time they had to get in the race, Bush's popularity was so high, no serious Democrat wanted to run. So he had all these, the seven was it? Seven, seven dwarfs. Seven, seven dwarfs. dwarfs. Yeah. And Bill Clinton had scandal after scandal, you know, I mean, it was like, you have George Bush and, and, and um, and Bill Clinton, and so it was a perfect opportunity. Perot went on the Larry King show, and there's so many similarities between Perot and Trump. Perot went on the Larry King show and said, and, and said two things. One, that whooshing sound you hear are jobs leaving America. You know, <laughs> that sound like Trump something that Trump would say. Uh, and this, and, the, and then the, the second thing that he said is, we're going to get when I get to. If I were president, I would get under the hood and fix it. But he never ever, in the course of the campaign. <laughs> That's not even how you fix a car anymore. Right. 
<laughs> yes, yes. I was telling my wife we were driving down, looking at some all the fancy stuff. I said, "Boy, I couldn't come close to hot wiring a car today." You know? <laughs> this was easy to do when I was a, a kid. Uh, so Perot uh, never could answer, never answer the questions. I went down there, and you know, on February twentieth, he had, he said that on the Larry King show, uh, four million people called the eight hundred number uh, to urge him to run for president of the United States. So when I went down there in June, he was ahead in 49 states. I mean, he was looking at an electoral college landslide, but he never answered the question of, when you get out of the hood, what are you gonna do? Much like the problem that Trump has today. You know, I, I don't know if you saw that interview with Melania and Trump on, on Sean Hannity. Melania kept saying, well, he's gotta be more presidential. He's gotta be more presidential. Well, easier said than done, because Donald Trump is like pro. He's a transactional person. He hasn't thought through any issues. He doesn't know what he thinks about anything. And so if you asked him, I want to build a high rise in Manhattan, should we use concrete or steel? You'd be very impressed with his answer. But if you ask him a question, okay, if abortion is illegal and a woman has an abortion, should she go to jail? Well, he doesn't know, so he says yes. You commit a crime, you go to jail. I mean, that's what happens. It's like Perot. You know, insisted on not having anybody write his speeches, not have advanced people. So he, he hops on his jet one day, flies to Nashville to speak to the NAACP, and the first thing he says, I'm here to help you people. You know, it, it's like he didn't know. He, you know, he just didn't know. And it, because Ross was, well, basically on the right, like I think Trump's on the right versus the left. They're transactional. They don't really know until the issue's in front of them. Melania in the, or not Melania, Ivanka in the um, uh, Barbara Walters interview, if any of you saw that, she said, saying I think it's really, really accurate, she said, my dad says the darndest things. We all do that. <laughs> she said, but when he has to make a decision, he gets the best and smartest people together, he listens carefully, and makes very wise decisions, and that's why he's been su successful. Well, that's, that's pro. I mean, they're exactly the same. The problem in politics, is nobody ever gives you the opportunity to be in office and have the transaction. You have to start answering what you're gonna do. And just one last point is, a little bit of likeness to the, to the Schwarzenegger thing, the Schwarzenegger phenomenon, although we didn't have economic stress, which is normally a prerequisite for a Schwarzenegger kind of candidate. What we did have is people were madder and a hornet over a gas uh, energy crisis that was deliberately caused by politicians looking out for themselves. We had a budget crisis that Gray lied about all during the campaign. And so after the election was over, he admitted we had a huge deficit. So there was this fervor of anger of voters after the 2002 campaign. And so people were ready for, for, for Schwarzenegger. He did a couple of smart things. One is he didn't announce until the last minute. Remember he went on the Jay Leno show uh, and did it on Jay Leno? The recall election was a short time frame. And what, did, what, did, what was his proism or Trumpism? You know, uh, Pro was, I'm going to uh, uh, get out of the hood and fix it. Trump says, we're going to make America great again. I mean, nobody knows what any of those things mean. And Arnold walked around with a broom, remember? He had a broom. He was going to sweep Sacramento clean. And he was going to go up there and he's going to blow up boxes. What boxes, you know? He never answered. And the one smart thing he did is, remember, the, the year before, he had sponsored a ballot measure for preschool and after school education. So it was the one thing, and Arnold is somewhat transactional too, the one thing he knew something about. So when Carla at the Chronicle would bug him, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? He'd default to, oh, how important education is. And with the tight time frame, next thing you know, election day, there's a guy with the broom, okay, let's sweep everybody out, and he won. If that had been a normal cycle, Arnold would have struggled because he didn't know, and unlike Trump and unlike Perot, Arnold was really studious. I mean, he let a lot of experts get in front of him, and he studied and he studied and studied something that Perot and, and Trump haven't done. But in terms of the campaign, there was a great, great deal of similarity. Yeah, Carla, let me bend the question a little bit. Um, I mean, we were talking last night, we got together. <laughs> we had a pre-event uh, pre caucus. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, you've got a candidate who insults an entire ethnic group, uh, and promises to build this massive wall. You've got a can candidates talking about each other's spouses. These are all rules you never break in politics. You expect the next day there to be the 
I, I, you know, I misspoke or I was misquoted, and instead Trump says, oh, listen to this. I, I mean, and, and going back to Arnold, I also remember him roaming around with a sledgehammer. He was beaten up on a car because of the vehicle license fee. Car tax, yes. Yeah, but, yeah, but from the media perspective, I no, mean, the, no, the never, rules yeah, seem to have been thrown right. out. Ne never has the media gotten one, one candidate so wrong, I think, in, at least that I can recall. I mean, from the first day of his campaign, when he started out, uh, you know, they're sending us rapists and criminals from Mexico. We, we were, <laughs> that's it, it's over. Uh, then, then he went on to the Muslims. Uh, then he went on to uh, the wives, uh, uh, penis size. What else could I, I can go on. I mean, at, at every juncture, we were like, oh, that, this is it, it's over. Uh, but the media has enabled this guy all the way through. Uh, when you look at the millions of dollars of free airtime he's gotten, and no other candidate can call into a, a, a morning talk show and get 40 minutes on the phone. Uh, and, and this is what he was getting all the way along. But you know, we had, we had sort of glimpses of how astute Donald Trump was with the media going back to like 2000 when he ran. You may, some of you may remember, he ran for president in 1999 as a Reform Party candidate. Uh, I covered him then. He came to California. And the guy is a master at working the media. He took us, all of us, on his Trump One plane, uh, which at the time had a round bed. Uh, <laughs> he, was, so he was traveling around with Melania, who was his girlfriend at the time. Uh, it had gold faucets. I mean, the thing was just unbelievable. And uh, for, from a media point of view, I mean, this guy was just fabulous to hang out with. He just wanted to have a beer with him. You know, he knew how to, how to uh, do a one-on-one. -on -one. He, he is one of those people who, really, I think, wants to be liked by the media. And so he was courting us big time. He, I mean, at one night he said, hey, let's go down to Jay Leno's. We'll hang out in the green room for an hour with him. We did that. Uh, we went, went to Tony Robbins and hang out. I mean, it was like a, a, a dream sort of a, a campaign. At the end of it, he sent us all personal notes that said, if you ever need anything, please call me. I mean, this guy knew how to work the media. And now we're seeing it again. Uh, in, in the beginning of his campaign, uh, for a long time, he never got those tough questions. It's only recently where he's had to sit down for an hour one-on-one -on -one with like Chris Matthews and, get, and gets these in-depth questions uh, where he doesn't have the follow-up answer. Um, I, I think I, I, on the one reason he's been successful, and I think it's true with Bernie Sanders too, I think people are so sick of the vetted, uh, poll-tested answers by these candidates. They're just tired of the, of the speechifying. And Donald Trump doesn't do that. Neither does Bernie Sanders, both of them. When, when Bernie Sanders came to the Chronicle, I was telling you last night for the first time, uh, I, I was still at the Chronicle then, and the editors were like, uh, who is this guy? Go interview him in a closet. Joe, we don't even know you. Uh, and, and I mean, he was just, nobody gave him any chance. But it's, in some respects, he, both of these guys have gotten, this, their strength is angry white guy. Uh, on both ends of the political spectrum, anti-trade of uh, people who are who feel alienated from the system. So I think I have to say one other parallel with both of these is their incredible uh, ability or, or use understanding of social media. Donald Trump has not had to buy millions of dollars worth of ads. He gets on Twitter and gets his message out directly to people every day, and we retweet him. Uh, he, he's done this just masterfully. Bernie Sanders is the same. The social media aspect of this campaign has changed a lot of it, and that's one of the reasons why we, the traditional media, I think, has been it, 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 uh, so long on this. This is the first sort of Twitter campaign, and uh, this is the first time that we're really seeing the effects of social media on how the voters are seeing it, and that has just changed the universe. Okay, I want to, I want to get in, into the appeal of Trump and Bernie. Before I do that, I want to ask Sal, since we have him here and his involvement with the Tea Party Express, a lot of people think, or some, including a member of Congress who spoke to this group yesterday, that some of the extremist sort of anti-government, anti-establishment rhetoric that seems to be plaguing the Republican Party is a direct result of the activities of the Tea Party, that it sort of fueled this anger, fueled this whole thing. You know, your Tea Party Express effort was to try and transform what a lot of people viewed as a sort of a bunch of goofballs dressed in like George Washington outfits <laughs> to, to do something meaningful and impactful. Um, but if you can talk a little bit about 
sort of the legacy of the Tea Party and whether or not that's a fair characterization of where it's led the party to now and, and whether or not it's a fair characterization of what the Tea Party was about. Sort of the history of how we got here. Uh, sure. It, what, what Bill said, you know, it, is important in, in his opening comments about how pronounced the Republican majority is in the House and in state legislatures across the country, ex excluding California. I mean, it, we have more Republicans and more conservatives in office than any time since 1926. And it's largely caused by what we generally call the Tea Party movement that started with on February 18th when Rick Santelli did a rant on CNBC and spontaneously we had a couple million people having rallies uh, you know, before April. The movement started as a, as a lot of movements do as a protest movement. And <clears throat> I look at the candidates for president and see the kind of the derivatives out of the Tea Party that they rep represent. The beginning was a protest. People were mad or at head. They, they kept saying, don't get involved in politics because it's dirty. Once you get involved, you dirty your hands, they're all crooks, they get rid of them all. If Ronald Reagan were in office, throw him out. It was just a negative, anti, throw all the rascals out. And we preached to everyone that, look, if you want to change policies, you got to change the players. You got to get involved in the political process. It, it, but it was kind of falling largely on deaf ears, although we, we hung on it. That protest movement, those people, and that sentiment is very much the Trump campaign. I'd also say it's very much the Sanders campaign. You know, Reagan used to always say, you know, all people and journalists and people on the inside always look at this left-right spectrum. Most Americans have no idea what you're talking about on a left-right spectrum. They see up or down. Who's going to make America a better place? Who's going to give my family more opportunities? And so you have to have your philosophy appeal to the ups. And that was what Reagan was always so, so good at. When Scott Brown ran for the Senate in Massachusetts, we were the first national group to get, in, get behind him and spend an awful lot of money. The Boston TV market was so expensive, there was so much money being spent. It was cheaper for us to go on Fox Cable and broadcast nationally than, than just in the Boston. Uh, so by doing that, it had the effect of nationalizing the election. So Tea Party people all over the country saw that we were involved in that Senate race. <clears throat> At the time, remember, Everybody thought he was the 60th vote, or the 40th vote to prevent the 60th vote uh, on Obamacare, and that his election would defeat Obamacare. And then the Democrats came up with reconciliation, only needed a majority. So when he won, all the Tea Party people said, wow, if we can win an election in blue Massachusetts, I can win in Wyoming, I can win in Kentucky, I can win in Alabama. Suddenly, the movement went from a protest movement to a political movement. And suddenly, everybody got involved in, in political campaigns. In, in a, in like the, there's the, on the left, there was the Occupy movement, which was similar. They were angry, and, you know. Uh, and for some of the same reasons, there was a lot of, actually, the guy that started Occupy is kind of an acquaintance of mine. We, we belong to a group we get together once a year. And, and, you know, he and I are really close, although he's a leftist and I'm on the right. But uh, very similar ideas that, that I think fueled both the Tea Party and the Occupy. But Occupy, they loved Obama. They liked Harry Reid. They loved Nancy Pelosi. Well, how could they become a protest, an, an election movement? They couldn't be because they liked all the people that were in. So that's why that petered out, I think, is that you can only protest for so long and then uh, what else are you going to do? The Tea Party then kind of broke into, there was still the Trump, kind of what I call the Trump faction, into three other factions. There were the people that were concerned about the intrusiveness of the federal government, and that got personified in Rand Paul, you know, who was worried that you might, you know, the president could have you droned on your way to work tomorrow, you know. And so all the intrusiveness people became Rand Paul people. There were some people who said, <clears throat> we got to go to Washington, just vote no. Say no to the budget, no to the debt extension, until you clean up our finances, we're voting no on everything. What does that sound like? That's Ted Cruz, <clears throat> you know. Ted, uh, I had dinner with Ted the night before he got elected. I said, he said, said, what's the one piece of advice you'd give me? I said, don't be a nut. Don't be on the 99 to one side. 95 to <laughs> of course, he laughed and said, I didn't expect that from you. you know? uh, I said, be like Ronald Reagan. Be on the 51 to 49, the 55 to 45 winning side. Reagan believed in winning. Be on the winning side. But a lot of our people don't care about winning. They want, oh, with you, vote no. That's Ted. And then some people said, well, look, <clears throat> 
They're not great in Washington, but let's get as many good people as we can and work with them as best we can. Who's that? It's Marco Rubio. So those are the, Trump was never, I mean, he showed up at a couple of Tea Party events, but those three senators were key Tea Party senators, and they reflect key threads in the Tea Party. But if you want to say, I think as some of my, my Democratic friends like to say, oh, well, the Tea Party's a bunch of nutty people that walk around in George Washington costumes and have a sign. Well, do you really think a bunch of crazy people on it with a sign had the profound impact on American politics to elect more people that are conservative since 1926? No, obviously, it's not a bunch of people that are running around that are doing that. What the Tea Party did is it awakened in people who even if you say, like Carla's mother, for example, do you belong to the Tea Party? She'll say no. Do you like the Tea Party? No. How did you vote? She voted for the Tea Party candidate because it touched on people that were concerned about the universal theme of all Tea Party groups, which is in opposition to the increasing size, cost, and intrusiveness of the federal government and a lack of pro-growth policies that give opportunity to everyone. That's, that's the one thing that every Tea Party group agrees with. Well, guess what? The majority of Americans agree with this. I w I'm at a meeting with Mayor Bloomberg when he was, before he was, you know, was still mayor and all of his top people. And I got done, they said, I can't believe this. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> Is it, and then somebody says, why do you hang out, hang, hang out with so many nutty people then? Uh, so there is the truth that, you know, when well, you it have- It does pay the bills. Huh? It does pay the bills. Yeah. <laughs> CNN, CNN was much better for us. You know, we did, we've done 511 rallies around the country. CNN covers us much better than Fox does, uh, contrary to what people with tend to expect. And Shannon, uh, 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 I can't think of his name now, uh, who was on our, our bus most of the time. We were in, the, we went to the, like Indiana or someplace, there was like five or 6,000 people. And there's some guy with an AK-47 standing there right outside the bus. So of course, Shannon goes racing down and they do a full interview with this guy. So afterwards I said, Shannon, I said, you got 4,000 wonderful people here that are, you know, they're concerned about the fate of their country and you find a one nut job in the crowd and you interview him. And he kind of looked at me and says, good point, but he makes great television. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. sometimes, you know, what you see on television isn't necessarily... You mean it's a skewed reality? It's a skewed reality. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start asking more general questions, so just jump in when you, when you feel like it, rather than wait for me to call on you. But we, I do want to get into what is Trump's appeal, uh, what is Bernie Sanders' appeal, and uh, what, are, what is the appeal of Ted Cruz other than he's not Trump? What is the appeal of Hillary Clinton? other than she doesn't seem to be able to excite people the way Bernie does. Who wants to make I, I think with Trump, um, we really underestimated how much immigration it, it, it seems to be uh, resonating with the people uh, that are behind him. This idea of the wall, which just about every expert has said is just impossible, uh, he, he continues to get cheers, uh, the, the issue with Mexico. Uh, even with the Muslims, you know, allowing Syrian refugees and so forth, it, I, I don't know if that's part of it, but it, it sounds like, I mean, it, part of it is, is just this anger at the system and, you know, we know what the demographic is with Trump, uh, generally sort of lower educated, but at the same time, I mean, uh, 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 when you look at some of these states, he's, he does get women voters. He does get, uh, uh, look at California, the field poll recently, He's, he do, is getting sort of across the board uh, education levels. It's kind of hard to figure out, but I, I do think it's that plain spoken, out there style, uh, not vetted, just putting it out there. And, and I, th I think voters are, 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 that appeals to them when so much, of the, so many of these candidates are so controlled and so freaked out about a YouTube moment that they will not speak to anybody unless it's, uh, it, it, there's a speech in front. Well, let me make, make kind of a point on immigration because I've got myself in, caught in this immigration thing myself a little bit. If you look at the thoughtful polls, you know, like Pew that actually do in-depth polling that, you know, and out of the political context, you find that this harsh rhetoric on immigration doesn't sell. That voters generally want to find a way to make the, people here illegally work, they want to fix the system. Uh, they, even Republicans want a pathway to citizenship, although you never hear a Republican candidate say that because there's anger out there and so in the political environment, it's like, ah, 
uh, you know, there's no rational discourse. But all the thoughtful polls show that there is. That, you know, once you get over this hump, I, I wrote an op-ed piece for, for Roll Call, and I, I thought it was pretty milk-toasty. I mean, I said, we should have a, a reform immigration, and it should serve the just interests of the United States. I, I didn't think it was Suck your neck out there, yeah. Huh? Suck your neck out there. Yeah, oh my God, I can't tell you. I mean, Ann Coulter and Laura Ingram, oh my God, I just got to solve it. Ironically, the first call I got was from Paul Ryan. He left me a message. It was like, literally, he must have gotten up early that morning. His message was, well, welcome to the club of saying something sensible and getting the <laughs> kicked out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to the original question here about Trump and Sanders, I would say Trump's main appeal is not necessarily policy. It's what he projects through the television screen. He is projecting strength all the time. Mm -hmm. When he doesn't project strength is when he's fumbling for an answer and searching for an answer. And that's happened in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And you're starting to see cracks in the facade. But I think people, uh, a large swath of folks out there want fairly simple answers. And they want it from somebody that appears strong. And uh, that sounds like an oversimplification, but I think there's definitely something to that. This is a reality TV cycle we're in. Don't underestimate the power of media and social media driving all of these dynamics. On the Sanders piece, I think um, there's a large swath of folks on the left side of the spectrum who have been waiting for a true liberal to sound like a liberal and not be afraid of how they might be portrayed. And being a democratic socialist, that's liberal, and he's <laughs> not mincing his words, and he's putting it out there, and there's been a hunger for that uh, on the left. So um, I can, I guess in retrospect, no, I didn't, no way did I see any of this coming, but in retrospect, I guess I start, I'm starting to understand what those appeals are on both sides. People talk though about how, you know, they're going after the same group and, and, and the disaffected white working class. Some of that's true, but I really do think um, there is some ideology uh, underlying this. And uh, the left has been waiting. And I, gotta, I have to say, there are young uh, women on my staff at the Capitol who are all about Bernie. And I sit and have these conversations with them. I say, this is the first time we have a chance to elect a woman president. That's why I'm endorse, endorsing Hillary Clinton. This is history in the making. But to the younger women, I really think it's their entire life they've known about the Clintons. And the Clintons are just kind of old news and they've been looking for something very different and fresh, as fresh as a 74-year-old socialist. Yeah. In <laughs> <laughs> but he's fresh to them, and somehow it's working. So we have very interesting debates uh, off hours. In our yeah, he's a small S yeah. socialist and a small D Democrat. So, so I think we determined that while Ben and Jerry's does have a Bernie-flavored ice cream, there is no such thing as a Bernie-flavored air conditioner, right? <laughs> uh, let me, I'm going to commit the sin now of oversimplifying here. And I think that what Trump and Sanders have tapped into something is, a, is just a feeling that the system screws you, albeit they've come to different conclusions of how you get screwed by the system. For Bernie, it couldn't be simpler than this. You are economically screwed by a system that what? Financially, you are punished and wealthy people get off the hook when the markets collapse. But you, you get foreclosed, you suffer. So the system is rigged in favor of wealthy people who buy and sell politicians. Plain, simple message, and it resonates in this day and age. Trump's is a little more complicated in this regard because he's tapping into several forms of frustration, a big one being middle-class economic frustration, the idea that you're not moving ahead like your parents and your grandparents did. You are dealing with an expensive mortgage and college payments and so forth. The economy doesn't deal for you, but also society doesn't seem to be dealing you any breaks. Let me ask you guys a simple question. Uh, this is a fascinating period of the year for me in that I have a lot of friends whose kids are going through college admissions right now. How many of you as Californians know parents whose kids do not get into Berkeley or UCLA as they might have expected? Yeah, mm -hmm. hands go up. Mm -hmm. I have uh, very close friends, both went to UCLA, their kid did very well in a very good private school, did not get into UCLA. They're mad. I'm not saying they're going to vote for Donald Trump as a result of this, but this is the kind of anger that Trump taps into. My God, I'm a taxpayer in California. My kid can't get into the UC school of his choice. We have an illegal immigration problem that politicians don't deal with. That immigration, by the way, two days before the election, November 6, 19, of 2016, is the 30th anniversary of what's called IRCA, the Immigration Reform Control Act of 1986, which mm -hmm. supposedly 
fixed immigration in America once and for all. But for the past 30 years, politicians have been dealing with the various failures of IRCA, promising to reform immigration, all failing to do it. It's become a horrible political situation. Trump, I would contend, be it through college admissions, through immigration, through economic stagnation, political correctness, you name it, taps into this frustration with voters. So that's the simplification, plain and simple, that they're just both tapping into frustration. You know, in, in income inequality slash economic uncertainty and immigration are two of the great waves of American political, I mean, there are you know, countless elections that were built around those two issues, aren't there, Sal? I mean, this is... I immigration and trade, when people are stressed economically, the two things they go after are free trade and uh, immigration. It's an easy, even though the illegal immigration has, you know, plummeted uh, since the Great Recession, you would think it's, you know, at 80s levels to that. I mean, it's just the frustration. I think Bill's right. I mean, well, there is an ideological tinge to it, but there's just, you know, a, a frustration thing, which I think is much more right. dominant than the ideology. I mean, I think, I, I think on the, on the income in inequality side, it's really interesting. I got two kids in their 20s. The millennial generation, they really feel this issue of, for instance, a housing prices. You're talking about San Francisco, Oakland, where you're talking, you know, $3,000 for a one bedroom apartment. A lot of my sons included are saying, I'm, I'm probably never going to be able to afford a house right. uh, in the Bay Area. And they, and they both have really good paying jobs. The fact is that this is this kind of stuff, just average. Is, is really affecting, I think, them on the left. That's why you're seeing them listening to Bernie Sanders, the millennials, and and. And, Sal, and Sal tapped into something very important here, in that uh, for Bernie voters and Trump voters, they're willing to cast aside a lot of ideological purity to vote for these people. Bernie, for example, is not very good on gun control, as far as most Democrats be concerned. He's voted time and again for various for various gun protections, if you will, because he's from a Vermont hunting country. Uh, but yet there are very liberal Democrats who, for whom that would normally be a deal breaker who will stick with them because they're looking at the bigger economic side of things. Trump, we play a fun what-if game in Republican politics. What if Ronald Reagan ran today? And you, yeah, you know how this yeah. goes, Sal? He wouldn't stand a snowball's chance because why? Well, he signed the abortion law in the 1960s and well, he was divorced and blah, 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 okay, blah. Well, yeah, right. so for the conservative voting for Donald Trump, Donald Trump has flipped how many times on abortion? He is not twice, but thrice marriage, which makes for an interesting trade-off for evangelicals who insist on, on the purity of the sanction of marriage. The list goes on in various ways in which Trump is not you know, sufficiently conservative. He has no interest in attacking entitlements and the size of government, yet they're willing to cast that entirely aside because they want to, they want to vent behind this guy. Yeah, he believes in the sanctity of marriage so much he's tried it several times. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to some real fundamental political questions. Is Trump gonna be denied the nomination? This is this is, to me is like one of the greatest dramas from a media point of view. I, I you know, it looks and if you do any of the crunching of numbers, it looks like he's not going to get to right. that magic number of 1237, even with California. Um, and so, how does and this is a question that we want the guru to answer. What happens if you come to the convention? Uh, does the Republican Party just drop kick the guy who, who uh, got the largest number of votes, and maybe the second guy? Uh, Ted Cruz and t and or, and the third guy and trying to turn to somebody outside that would that would be revolution would it not I mean let, let me let me tee this up for yeah. Sal yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put the ball over the hoop and you throw it through let's assume that Trump does not get to 1237 if you University of Virginia has what's called the Center for Politics Larry Sabato who you see on TV runs it uh, they actually crunched numbers they gave you a whole spreadsheet of how Trump got from March 22nd could get to 1239 and get two more delegates than he needs. But the problem is it starts with him getting 30 delegates in Wisconsin. He's already, uh, uh, he's already 24 shy of that. He only got six. And it goes on down. He'd have to pretty much run the table in California to get to 1237 or close. So he's going to be shy. And we can. And let me interject. California yeah. is about as convoluted a uh, primary process as you can have because it's by congressional district, by congressional district. Right. Right. Yeah, and so I'll explain that to us as well. But. Yeah. Um, Anyway, he's not going to get the nomination, let's assume, on the first ballot. But I think what people miss is that people assume that we go straight from June 7th in the primaries in the convention. Well, the answer is no. There are five plus weeks between the last vote and the convention, at which time John Kasich will be busy doing what he's doing. Ted Cruz will be busy doing what he is doing. But Donald Trump, who may be just 100, 200 delegates shy, will be in a position to make deals. Sal, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know, we're used to the nominee winning a lot of states and everybody getting out and then the nominee. So that's kind of the normal. And so what happens really at a convention, you don't really know until you have a contestant one. And we haven't had, I think, 1976 campaign I was involved in uh, with then Governor Reagan uh, against, uh, against um, President Joe Ford. Yeah. Ford. yeah. How quickly? Yeah, how yeah, quickly <laughs> Ford against Pre President Ford. The, when the, in California, it's a little different. The way we pick our delegates is the candidates submit a slate of three people by congressional district. And whoever wins that congressional district gets their three delegates. Right. We're simple. So, you know, I had to put the Reagan delegation together in 84. I picked every single person, you know, and met all of our quotas that we had. Uh, and, I, you know, we picked everybody that I made sure that we had enough ties into those people that on any vote on credentials or platform, I could control that delegation every single vote. There was not a weak vote on that delegation. Totally, we had total control. But, you know, because I, I got to pick, I picked every single person myself. In a lot of states, in most states, the delegates get elected in kind of a party process where you go to a precinct caucus or then you go to a city caucus and then you go to a county, you become delegates to the county committee and then the county, you're know, delegates to the state committee and then they pick. And so this process starts sometimes, you know, a year or, and to get to know people a couple of years early. I ran Jack Kemp's, you know, his pre-presidential pack. 1993 when he started, he was thinking he was going to run in 96. We started four years early. We had a meeting every single week with lawyers and everybody going over every single state, every single delegate, how we could make sure they were be a count person. If we got to a contested convention, we wanted to control the convention. Donald Trump never dawned on him because his quote, quote unquote, uh, whatever he calls it, world class campaign wasn't. It was amateur night in Dixie. And it's been amateur night in Dixie mm -hmm. until this week when he hired a guy named Paul Manafort who really knows how to run a convention operation. But the problem is, is Ted Cruz has been on this since he started. So he's, ha he's been winning these precinct coxes that don't make the news, these county coxes that don't make the news, and now suddenly the state conventions are picking the delegates. Well, they're picking out of the pool of people who have already been selected. So even in states where Trump has delegates, the people that are selected to be the Trump delegates are really for Ted Cruz in many of the cases. So when there is a credentials fight, of which there's already some brewing, a big dispute in the Virgin Islands to seat the Virgin Island uh, delegation, well, Trump at this point looks like he may have control of the, of the votes in the convention, which means he can seat the Cruz delegation from Virgin Islands and not see the Trump one. So even where there, there are Trump's one, they can take some of those delegates, delegates out by having credentials fights, where, where Cruz, I think, is gonna have control of it, although it's not quite sure yet, but it looks like he is. So the reason the, the first ballot is so important, if the first ballot, in the first ballot, almost all the Delegates are required to vote as their state law dictates or their state party rules dictate. And so if Trump has more than 1,237, he's the nominee. If he doesn't and it goes to a second ballot, he loses hundreds of delegates because they're for cruisers. They were from Cruz all along, or they might be for Rubio or Kasich, but they're not for Trump. And that's why that's what it's finally dawned on him that if he's short, he's screwed. He can't, he can't get there, and that's why he just hired one of the best convention delegate counters in the country, a guy named Paul Manafort, which is the first serious person Donald Trump's hired in his entire campaign. But is there going to be a riot? As it has just been yeah, riots in the streets. You know, yeah. um, you have so, Roger Stone, one of Trump, Trump's aides, saying he's going to be call, you know, calling the hotel rooms. It, it's an ugly process. I mean, it was really ugly in 76, you know, because we were running against an incumbent president. And you know, you have a tendency to think that the, everybody's high-minded. It was not a high-minded operation. Quick show of hand, how many people think this is a high-minded process? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was ugly, and the president had a lot of power, and so all, these, all the undecided delegates 
They got invited to state dinners. They were flying on Air Force One. Uh, uh, they got all the perks, you know. They got to go on the aircraft carrier in New York Harbor and watch the 4th of July. Uh, they got wine and dine. I mean, it, it, it was, and of course, we had Jimmy Stewart and Pat Brown that we'd call them, you know. That's, we had some Hollywood people to do it, but we were no match for the President of the United States. So the over and under of number of rounds of golf and free golf club memberships and free hotel rooms that Donald Trump gives yes. away. Yes, I mean, you know, anytime you're in New York, you've got a place to stay, you know. I mean, <laughs> You, you, you honorary member of the country club in L.A., whatever so, it's So even though he's coming late to it, he does have something he has, he um, has, he has to, by which he can woo people. Could which just, could just, could and it depends how, how close Weekends he is. at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. 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 If he's 20 votes short, you know, there's going to be 20 people that are going to want to stay at yeah. Trump Tower. You're going to want to be <laughs> you're going to want to be one of those 20 people in yeah. the next year, in the next six months. And he'll send the Trump plane to pick you up from you know the Virgin Islands and fly you to uh, the Trump Tower. <laughs> yeah. So if he's t 20 votes short, then I don't think there's any stopping it that he'll get the votes. If he's 200 votes short, then I think he's done. Yeah. Then I don't. Then I think it's hard to see that even though in theory we could go to a third and fourth ballot and and go to a new candidate, I think it would be very difficult to bypass Cruz at that point. If, if Trump, okay, that's the next question. If, if it is not Trump, who is it? Because we're seeing, uh, you know, a groundswell movement for Ryan, uh, who is denying as vigorously that he wants to be the nominee as he denied that he wanted to be speaker. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here's the question. If Ted Cruz walks into that convention, he's, what, over 500 delegates now? Let's see, he walks in with 700 delegates, just to throw out a number, 500 plus shy of the nomination. Let's say Trump does not get it on the first ballot, and so now a group of states can break away. I think California can't break away until after the second ballot. Not I think it's second. Yeah, but a lot of states can break away after the first. So, do you now see a land rush of delegates go over to Ted Cruz, who's been the last few weeks doing this, trying to line up delegates who will go to him on the second round? Does Cruz pick up enough delegates to go over the top or does the Republican National Committee, the dreaded GOPE, the Republican, the GOP establishment, do they come to the conclusion that, wait a second, door number two is not much more pleasant than door number one? In this regard, um, Trump will contend that he'll win a national election because he will bring out new voters, voters who don't ordinarily go to Republicans, blue collar voters. He'll win in states Republicans don't win. Uh, pessimists like me see a 400 electoral vote drubbing as a result of this. Uh, but if you look at Ted Cruz, the question is, can Ted Cruz grow the Republican Party, or is he going to be locked in somewhere between the 59 to 61 million votes that John McCain got? I'm a pessimist again. I think he is locked in as well as a candidate. So does the party try to find a way to deny Cruz the nomination? In which case, I think now you're looking at a very bad result, because now you are looking at a rigged convention in many ways, and making two factions, not just one unhappy. And I think that's probably, even though personally I'd probably like to see Paul Ryan as a nominee, I think he'd had the best chance of those three to win an election. I don't see how the party comes out as a happy, smiling family if you do that. I think the Kasich, the Kasich plan, which people keep telling Kasich to get out, I mean, his whole theory is that Ted is not going to do well in many of the remaining primaries, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware. Right. Connecticut, I think, I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly yeah. which ones are yeah. left. Yeah. And that he'll be second. And that by being second, and maybe even winning someplace, and certainly winning a pile of delegates, he'll make the viability test. Uh, so that today, it, it's not rational to think about anybody other than Trump and Cruz. I mean, that we'd have a revolt, you know, it'd be so bloody. But if Casey does well, and that's what his bet is, then he might be able to emerge and so that he becomes a viable alternative is because, remember, Rubio's got 100, 176 delegates. There's another 50 delegates to, that Bush has and Rand Paul has and Carson has. And so there's a pile of delegates that are not committed to any of the three remaining candidates that are, that are out there. That if, it's, if they're far enough away from the 1237, suddenly, it's, it's a new ball game. Is Kasich more electable in the fall than Trump or Cruz? I mean, that's what... I, I that's his other argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's I, I, th argument. I, I think generally, yes. I mean, you know, I, I have a fault with the way... With, with Kasich. I mean, I've known John Kasich for, for 40 of my 50 years. He was on the, our Reagan, Ohio staff in 1976 when we were running against Jerry Ford. Right. So this idea that, you know... And he worked for a congressman named Buzz Lukens, who was one of the most conservative members of Congress we've ever had. So for someone to call Jim, 
John Kasich a liberal is ridiculous. You know, all these attacks on him, oh, he's really liberal. You know, he's just a very rational human being rather than, I think he's very, very conservative. But he has a very appealing get along with everybody. Everybody likes John. I mean, I think it's a much more appealing face. So I, I think he would be a stronger nominee at the end. But you, you can't forget the, you know, 1980, there was a lot of misgivings about Ronald Reagan in 1980. Everyone's forgotten about how many, much misgivings. We had a relatively moderate congressman, but hardly a liberal named John Anderson from Illinois, who ran as a third party candidate because he said Reagan's gonna ruin the Republican Party. A lot of the establishment were uncertain. Uh, and so Reagan was behind in the polls. It's, so who keeps saying that? Uh, Trump keeps saying that. Well, Reagan was way behind Carter and he won. Uh, totally different situation, but anyway. But Reagan's poll numbers weren't the greatest. And he did something at the convention that, you know, there's a kind of a funny story. I don't know if you, Stu Spencer, who ran Reagan's campaign and then got mad at the way he was treated, ran Ford's campaign in 76 against Reagan. And so they brought him back. And so he was in the 80 and, and all the other campaigns. Stu has, has told the story many times is they were walking back uh, to after Reagan had been, won the nomination in 1980, and they were walking back to Reagan's hotel suite, and Reagan turned to him and said, Stu, well, who do you think should I pick as my vice president? And Stu said, you ought to pick George Bush. And Reagan, who had pretty, didn't swear by today's standards, he didn't swear at all, you know. It was, you know <laughs> SOB, that was as tough as Reagan ever got. He was really, pretty, did not use harsh words. Well, he used a harsh word and said, I don't, why would I pick him? Not only do I can't stand the guy, but he disagrees with us on all the fundamental issues. And so, you know, Reagan hopped off and went back in the room. So, first few days later, he's naming George Bush as his vice presidency. Yeah. And so, Reagan went to Stu and says, how'd you know I was going to do that? And Stu said, because Ronnie, I know you're a practical guy, you're going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And here's the big difference between mm -hmm. politics then and now. In 1980 with Reagan and Bush, yeah, there were some personality clashes, but it was primarily the, the, the pain was over Bush calling Reaganomics voodoo economics. It was a policy beef. Notice how in today's race, everything is excruciatingly personal. That Donald Trump and Ted Cruz have gone at it over their wives. Uh, with Jeb Bush, he was a whip, little Marco, the hands, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And this is why when you look at the Republican convention, it should be as simple as an exercise in origami. You just fold the party together and you move forward. Donald Trump and Ted Cruz merge, or Donald Trump and John Kasich move, or Cruz and Kasich you know, merge together. Pick it up. But these factions are so dead set against each other right now and have all said, hell no, I will not run with this guy that this adds to the log jam. And this is part of the problem today's politics that things have become very bruising, very personal. And you see this now emerging on the Democratic side where now Bernie is finally starting to make it personal with her, whereas he would not go near, for example, the email thing. Now he's starting to talk about the server bit. He's talking about her as being not fit for office. And mark my words, if he keeps us up for a few more weeks, if she will, re she will is, return is the, fire. Is the so. difference that um, whoever the nominee is on the Democratic side, it looks like Democrats will, most Democrats will come together. I think there's 20% of the Bernie people say they will not vote for Hillary, yeah. but it's, it's generally, she has a very positive uh, poll rating among Democrats. On the Republican side, it's different, you, right? I mean, uh, a lot of the Trump people will the, never. I think the division is narrowing. Yeah. You think Although so? On, on, They'll you know, get in 1980, the Democrats, the Kennedy Democrats were so mad at Carter, they wouldn't support him, and there was a lot of, probably one of the reasons why Carter didn't do well. Kath? So, I'm the only open Democrat on the panel here, but I, <laughs> I want to comment on, okay. I want to comment on. That was a booing line. <laughs> that was a tough, tough step I want to comment on the, the specter of a contested Republican convention. Part of me is, is salivating at that. If, if the Republican Party is divided, I think that means uh, a Hillary Clinton presidency uh, is almost assured. If Trump or Cruz emerge, I think a Clinton presidency is almost assured. Uh, what scares me the most is a exciting, contest, contested, reality TV style political convention in Cleveland where the eyes of the country are watching the Republican Party and have totally forgotten about the Democratic Party and want to see who emerges and it becomes this great drama and somebody like a Kasich or a Ryan who really do have broad appeal or as a ticket, that would be, that would scare the heck out of me. Uh, who wanted to elect uh, a Democrat. So there's potentially a great drama that can play out here. 
uh, over the summer. Let me just say though, you know, as a Democrat, I don't mind seeing a split Republican party so we can be successful this fall, but it's not good for America to have a divided Republican party. The process of governance, the things that Congresswoman Eshi was talking about, about you know, a strong Democratic party, a strong traditional Republican party, and yes, there's that middle there, but two parties working together to find um, some solutions, make some progress, deal with dysfunction, all those things. So, um, and, and the, let me just say, while I have the floor, the role of social media, mm -hmm. do not underestimate that. Uh, there's, there's a whole theory out there that when a new communication medium takes hold, the traditional political party structures fracture and something new emerges. And I think the power of the internet and social media, fundraising and all organizing and all sorts of things, we may be in the midst of a generational, if not a political revolution like Bernie's talking about, certainly uh, a restructuring and realignment of how politics in this country works going a, forward. A campaign revolution. Since you've got the floor, let me start off the other question. Can Bernie Sanders stop Hillary from getting the nomination? I, you know, I don't think Bernie Sanders can stop Hillary from getting the nomination, just mathematically, uh, the super delegates, um, if there was something really unexpected, you know, like an indictment or something, that's not coming. Um, let me just say though, the field poll came out this week and Bernie's about seven points back, I think, which was a lot closer than I thought. I mean, California is traditionally Clinton country, but I do think there's, there's something called the Roush rule that uh, a, a candidate uh, can't get elected if they've been on the national scene for more than 14 years. <laughs> I think there's a fatigue factor with Clinton. However, I think she ultimate, ultimately succeeds. And the turnout and enthusiasm concerns around the Clinton campaign will quickly go away if there's a Trump or a Cruz at the top of the ticket. So I'm not too worried about it's getting people energized into we, the polls. We call them Hillary and Bernie, but we call them Trump and Cruz. I want I don't know what that means. Um, I, also, I also think uh, the Latino vote. Uh, when you talk about the Trump uh, candidacy, uh, that is going to be, I mean, I think, it, is, is it Univision that's out there with the, yeah. the voter drive, three million voters? Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard it. Uh, 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 a Latino activist uh, told me uh, that when he was growing up, his parents put on him the deport Pete Wilson button and uh, that, that he's now putting on his daughter the drunk, dump Trump button. And that this is going to, I mean, people have made the uh, comparison about Pete Wilson and, yeah. and um, uh, Prop 187. I don't well, I'm sure Bill advised against that when he was working <laughs> for Pete. Um, anybody here think that Sanders can stop uh, Hillary Clinton? I mean, among the panelists. Oh, I thought you meant the audience. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody up here? Anybody they're, they're, at, they're, they're expecting you to tell them. Uh, no, I, it's the super deal. It's funny. So after the um, 2012 election, the Democratic National Committee actually explored the idea of what to do about superdelegates. And there was actually a proposal to ditch the superdelegates. And Deborah, Wa Deborah Wasserman Schultz probably deserves a good position in the Hillary administration because she shot down the movement. They made a compromise. They took the number of superdelegates down from, I think, 20% to the current 15% or the 700 plus you have right now. But that's her buffer at all times. Um, that said, she is a weak general election candidate and it's the rule, it's the freshness if you will. She struggles with just everyday campaign events. The, the subway turnstile is a very good example. Did you watch Saturday Night Live last night? <laughs> that, was, that was the cold opening. Now, in fairness, yeah, she put a Metro card and it didn't work and how many of us have had a swipe card that doesn't work? Uh, my issue with that, though, is just riding a subway car, well, for her, it's probably the fourth time that she's been on a subway, the three previous times being when she ran for president in 2008 and the other two times she ran for <laughs> Senate. But there's a certain just kind of cliche triteness to, I'm in New York, I'm going to ride on a subway train. Uh, Ted Cruz going to a matzah factory in Brooklyn. And, you know, <laughs> I'm not anti-Semitic. Look at me. I like matzah, too. Um, she, she struggles with being... Smart. She struggles with being fresh and new age, if you will, and it's the fact she's been on the stage for 25 years. And this is one of the kind of interesting disconnects within the Democratic Party. For a lot of younger Democratic voters, Bill and Hillary should be their avatar. They were children when Bill and Hillary were in office. They came of age politically. When the Clintons ran the White House, they should be the equivalent of the Kennedys, the Roosevelts, actually, Democrats who, for decades after Franklin Roosevelt passed, were Democrats because FDR was their president. That's what they assumed being in a party was. But the Clintons don't seem to have this 
lasting hold on their party, if you will. Um, it's a very interesting question, I think, moving forward, if somehow Hillary manages to lose this election, where does the Democratic Party go in the next four years? Because getting back to what Sal and I talked about, it's a very hollowed out party with only 19 governors, I think, and low numbers in Congress. But, but you know, aside from the Latino vote too, uh, Bill, I think with the women's vote, uh, you, you, you can't underestimate the power of that one when you talk about all the, we have not even heard the beginning well, of uh, the, the Donald Trump tapes with Howard Stern so, so I think, uh, I think and how, how those are going to play with women voters. And then we talked about this before, yeah. but the, the Republican Party and its whole Planned Parenthood, uh, going after Planned Parenthood, you know, uh, as an organization that uh, where one in four American women have, have in some time in their life have gone to Planned Parenthood or sent somebody in their family to Planned Parenthood, that whole issue, I've heard a Republican women say that that, uh, that motivates them and, and will motivate them and whoever is the Republican uh, nominee. I, I don't think that uh, Sanders can beat Clinton unless something extraordinary happens, but he can be a big headache because if he upsets her in New York, then my guess is he wins in California. Yeah. He's not going to catch her, but he's going to go to that convention and divide, demand his rightful place. You know, Ron Paul went to the Republican convention to demand his rightful place, so they changed the rules that you needed eight states instead of five, so he couldn't get nominated and couldn't get the floor. You're not going to be able to deny Bernie Sanders the floor of the Democratic convention. And then, what does he say? How happy is he? You know, does he? So how do if he wins California and New York, he's going to have a high sense of entitlement when he gets to the you convention. Know, can you just say, I've always had a sense that Bernie. Um, sees himself as part of a movement, but never quite saw himself as going all the way, becoming the nominee and yeah. becoming a president. However, over time, and just recently now, yeah. as this thing starts to turn a little ugly, he may have the taste in his mouth a little bit that he may have a shot, and, and he may think he's got momentum to do North, New York and California. I mean, that alone is an amazing achievement. I mean, he's raised more money online that mm -hmm. has like ever been raised. He's he's changing the way uh, uh, the Democratic Party at least does politics. You know, he's kind of the heir of Jerry Brown in 1992, the one eight hundred number. Yeah. Howard Dean, <laughs> Howard Dean, and and the use of the internet. Obama taking that to the next level, and then now Sanders in the in the social media era and the role of raising small dollar donations online to counter. Uh, the super PACs and the, and the billionaires that are trying to influence this election. He has truly tapped something, but, but he's changing the way, he's absolutely changing the way candidates will run for political office at that national level going forward. So he's already achieved a lot. The key is folding him in and his 75% of supporters that are open to backing Hillary. If we have that kind of energy and unity uh, going up against um, what I think are, are, are pretty marginal candidates in, in Trump and Cruz, uh, I think it's going to be but is, Isn't he facing sort of the same issue that Donald Trump is right now, which is details, fuzzy answers. Uh, I mean, the, he was asked about breaking up the big banks. Uh, he didn't really have a plan. He didn't have a plan. This is just sort of a central thing with his yeah. campaign. Um, the follow-up questions, uh, he, he hasn't had the answers to those, and that's where uh, this could sort of so you're in a situation like with Trump where if he doesn't have answers, if his policy depth is really pretty shallow, is the people already believe him will stick with him. I assume they're as passionate about him as Trump people are about Trump. Yeah. But the question is how many of the you know unconverted can you convert over to your side? And this is the problem with being short on policy. But you know, does he really feel the pressure to do media and do policy questions? Does he have to sit down with the press? Because this gets back to I was talking earlier. One of the changes of this election is there was a time when you ran a campaign and you lived in dread of being taken down by the likes of the Washington Post or the New York Times. A bad story comes out. You saw this early, by the way, in the race with Marco Rubio. The New York Times did a story which alleged that Rubio bought a yacht. Right. And it turns out the yacht was actually a fishing boat. But there was a time when that would be a very bad three or four day story and it could scuttle a campaign. That story really had no traction, I'd argue, in part about social media. So. My question is, moving forward with Bernie, does he really need to sit down and have long discussions with the likes of your Politico or the Post or the Times and really lay out positions, or can he just kind of keep, keep tap, tap, tap dancing like he is right now? Well, one of the things we learned, and I think we learned it most, especially in 80 with Reagan, is at some point you have to convince people that you're capable of doing the job, especially for those issues that might not come up. That was the big question for Reagan, and I think he answered it successfully, uh, helped us no small part by 
Carter's own ineffectiveness as a candidate. Right. But it, it does seem like there's an opportunity here that's, you know, you ask what Bernie's going to do at the convention. They keep waiting for him to yell at everyone, all these kids to get off my lawn because he just seems like he's just sort of angry all the time at somebody. Those are, those are his people. But it, the conventional wisdom, which in this year has been neither, um, is that um, if the Republicans nominate Trump or Cruz and the Democrats nominate Hillary, it's an easy win for the Democrats who you know, can't underestimate their ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, so the question is, is that how it's going to play out? You know, let's talk about the general election. It, does Hillary win it if it's one of those two? Does Hillary win it if the Republican Party is a mess because of the way they end up nominating somebody? The Democrats have a long history of making a mess of their own nomination process. So where is all this going to play out? Well, and I think, I think you're going to say, if, if Trump is denied the nomination, he's going third party. Well, he can't even get on the ballot no. in most of the states. I don't think he will. Is that right? I don't yeah. Think he will. No. Is it so? It's too late for him to. There are some states have sore losers provisions where if you exactly. run, you can't. <laughs> you know, some, yeah, if you run and you deny the nomination, you can't run. It's a third party candidate for that reason. For that, I like the sore loser one. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think there's so many factors there. Look, Bill Clinton on his own is a factor, as we saw this last week. Uh, yelling at Black Lives Matter voters, that kind of action can suppress a lot of you know, like progressives. They, they may just take a walk. Um, I think running mates are going to be interesting to, uh, to see. Who, you know, who does Donald Trump or Ted Cruz have as a running mate? Uh, is it Kasich? I don't, or is it more whatever? I, you know, uh, on, on Hillary Clinton's side, there's a lot of sort of more traditional, there's talk about uh, Julian Castro, who's uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. I've heard a lot of talk about Javier Becerra uh, here in uh, California, who's head of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, and, and people think that he is a, he might be a very strong uh, voice, and it would be historic uh, to have a Latino running mate. So you're all avoiding answering the question. <laughs> what do we think is going to happen? Who do you think is going to win the White House? I'd say, I'd probably, right now, I'd say Hillary just because she's in the easier position to get the nomination and she's in the easier position going forward election. Elections are about electoral votes. And if you just start 2016 as a reboot of 2012, she has 332 and the Republican to be named later has 206. It means that Republican has to pick up Florida, has to pick up Ohio. That's a combined, I think, 47 electoral votes. I do this way too much, as you can tell, as I know this stuff. Uh, yeah. That takes the Republican, oh, it takes the Democrat down to 285. The Republican then has to win Virginia, which gets you to 272, then any state puts you over the top. If the Republican can't win Virginia, which trends more Democrat with each cycle, they've now got to run the table in Iowa, Colorado, maybe Nevada. In other words, for a Republican, it's almost like playing a game of eight ball where you cannot afford to miss a shot, whereas she has states to give. So, advantage Hillary. Yeah, I, I was playing on my um, electoral college calculator this morning, so I could try to know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> And the, clo the highest I could come up with for Trump punching in the states was like 260. And that's like under the best possible scenario. So going in, I mean, just when you look at the Electoral College map, Hillary has a, a tremendous advantage, at least at the outset. But, you know, I've been around long enough, sort of be careful what you wish for. I mean, I think Trump or Cruz lose badly, but I also know it's politics, so, you know, it depends on how the, the conversation evolves. And everybody tacks to the center, and suddenly uh, Donald Trump and Cruz don't sound so out there because they've learned they need to have broad appeal. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's advantage Clinton. Uh, but the vice presidential choices will, particularly this cycle, I think, particularly this cycle, uh, will affect the conversation. Normally, it's, it's just sort of a backwater deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, think your, I think your choices uh, given the advanced age, I gotta be careful with that one. Given the fact that <laughs> yeah, watch out. Given the fact that Clinton and Trump uh, will both, if, if either succeeds, will be among the oldest presidents ever. Who their uh, vice presidential choice is and a potential successor uh, does matter. Sal, you you know Cruz, and you know Trump as well. It, not as well, but is there something about them that, that most of us don't know? And, you know, there's a, well, most of these guys, when they reach this level, 
have an ability to appeal to people that, that if, if either one of those guys was speaking in this room, you'd be impressed with them, even if you didn't agree with them, because they don't get where they are by accident. They're good at what they do. Is there something about them that a general election may show that changes the dynamic, that changes the conventional wisdom? Well, I guess I, I, would, I would say this. I mean, well, first, let me just knock out the Democrats for a second. Sure. <laughs> Jack Kemp used to always have a, this thing he'd always say is, to be successful, you have to be in concert with the zeitgeist of the times, which he'd say, and I'd say, nobody knows what the hell zeitgeist means. But <laughs> didn't stop him from using it. But you have to be in concert with the, the essence of the times. Hillary Clinton is so out of concert with the zeitgeist of the times. Uh, I, I think that's her biggest problem. She's, she's the wrong cat at the wrong time. You know, people aren't looking for somebody who has long storied experience in Washington, D.C. It, it's just, it's not where the country is today. So I, I think she's an extremely vulnerable candidate. Of course, you have to go look at the other side. It's not, not in the vacuum. But if you look at how we elect presidents, we tend to elect presidents kind of looking ahead. It, it's sort of like where we're going. We never go back, you know. I always, I thought the Dole campaign was one of the worst campaigns, but Clinton has a bridge to the future, and Dole came up with, I don't know, some like connection to the past. I was like, huh? <laughs> I'll, be Ronald, so I'll, be, I'll be Ronald Reagan if you want me to be. Pardon me? He literally said, I'll be Ronald Reagan if that's what you want me to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think Hillary is an extraordinarily vulnerable candidate, uh, just looking at, at, at her. Um, Sanders is very much like Ted Cruz. I mean, I, I saw it Diane Feinstein when she was doing her run the other day through California. Somebody asked her, would you do a lot of stuff with Bernie Sanders? She said, no, I don't. I do more with Republicans. Because Bernie, and that's why he didn't know the answer in the, in the, in the press, he's not somebody who gets things done in Washington. You know, like Cruz is there saying he's going to vote no on everything, and that's what he does. So he doesn't have to figure out how, how do you solve the problem when I'm voting no. Bernie does sort of the same way. He's not engaged. He's not involved in the process. He just sort of demagogues everything. So, you know, Diane Feinstein, who's a get things done kind of person, she doesn't waste her time with Bernie Sanders. She'd rather go to somebody, you know, Susan Collins and work with a Republican from Maine who she can work with. Um, so, it's, it, so for Bernie Sanders, I think who his running mate is becomes crucially important. Hillary, I don't think it matters because she is such a dominant personality and the Clintons are so dominant, I don't think it matters who she picks as a running mate because it's going to be all about Clinton. For the Republicans, I have some mutual friends of Donald Trump. They all tell me that Donald Trump in private is nothing like the person you see in the media. That he's soft-spoken, he's nice, he's pleasant, he's thoughtful, he's generous, he's kind. I mean, it's like, and I, trust me, I've quizzed these people. I said, are you sure? <laughs> you know, I, I've only met Donald Trump once. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny. Roger Stone has been in the news now, you know, the dirty trickster is sort of what he's known for. He's represented Donald forever. And in 1984, at the Republican convention, he had something to do, and his, Donald was there with his first wife, and the, the, the oldest kid who was like seven years old at the time. And so he, he said, you gotta take him and entertain him for the night because I gotta go to a meeting. So I entertained the Trumps and I forgot that Donald Jr., whatever the Donald kid Jr., is. Donald Jr., yeah, yeah. Yes, and he was very polite and very thoughtful and very nice. This is 1984. My wife was with me and I, and I said to her, I said, what did you think of him? She doesn't remember. <laughs> I don't even remember being with him, so. Uh, but anyway. Uh, but what Trump is, if you've seen, is that he's just the magic, he has the magic of reinvention. Uh, you know, he, his wife, Melania, keeps saying, well, you know, he can be presidential. He says he can be presidential. He's reinvented himself so many times. Can he reinvent himself as a good presidential candidate? I mean, I'm highly skeptical, but I'm not going to count this guy out. He's done, he's done some magician work so far. Ted Cruz, you know, Ted has in some ways, the, in a lot of different ways, but in some ways, the Reagan problem in that there's great uncertainty among a big wide swath of the electorate and certainly in the establishment. Reagan had the problem in 1980, as did, does Cruz. Reagan <laughs> solved it, you know, one is that he was so darn friendly and easy to get like along with. And he also picked George Bush, the icon of the establishment. So he put all the concerns away 
and then his likability factor and mm -hmm. the bad candidacy of, of Carter, you know, he got elected president. Well, I think it's vitally important who Ted Cruz picks as his running mate. I mean, it's hard to see him pick, you know, under the circumstances, you know, Jeb Bush who would kind of do that establishment thing or, or Marco Rubio, but he could pick a Kasich and, you know, Kasich is really well liked by, I mean, everybody likes John Kasich, even though he can get cranky sometimes, but we haven't seen that in the, so far. But I think it's vitally important who Ted picks. If Ted picks somebody that agrees with him to vote no all the time, then, boy, the public's going to have a bad choice, and then, you know, Hillary's looks looking a lot taller. But if Ted reaches out like Reagan did and unifies the party, and we can come out of Cleveland unified, I, I wouldn't rule Ted Cruz out by, by any stretch. But isn't the, isn't the question, what is the effect on the Republican Party? If, if it's a Donald Trump campaign, uh, uh, candidacy. Well, which Donald I, Trump? Oh, yeah, right. yeah. That's I mean, but how, how does he get away from what he's already said with regard to Latinos, Muslims, and so forth? I mean, uh, and women. Uh, how, how, how much can you distance yourself from that? How much does that affect future generations? I, I, whether it's Cruz or yeah. Trump, yeah, I, how many, what, what percentage of the Latino vote did George Bush get? 30 something percent? And that was, that's the highest number ever. I mean, you have to have that. That is the, the fastest growing electorate I think in for the Trump, United I States. I think if the cannot, simplest thing for Trump, and this is why actually I, I probably uh, say something most people disagree with, if I were Hillary, I'd much rather run against Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, I think, for this reason. Uh, because Cruz does have the persona of being a blocker in Washington, not wanting to do things in Washington. Whereas Trump, if I were advising him for the general election, every time somebody would come after me on Latinos, on women, name the blank, I would say, you're offering a distraction. I want to go to Washington and do things and then talk about two or three things I want to get done because that's what I'd be worried about running against Trump that he could tap into, that people want the fever broken. They want somebody to actually go to Washington and do things, plain and simple. So let's talk a little bit about the role of the news media in this election <laughs> um, or whether there has been one. I mean, first of all, we, we all know, if you haven't read, Donald Trump has gotten billions of dollars of free media because he understood how to use that whole system better than anybody. And obviously, they give him 40 minutes of airtime because he was driving ratings for them, just like he's driving clicks on exactly, different websites. Yeah. It's almost as if the media is like one of those little birds on the back of a rhinoceros. It's mm -hmm. along for the ride and you can pick the fleas, but you're not in charge of where this thing is going. Is, is it frustrating? Is it um, difficult? What's it like? I mean, you've been doing this a long time, and there was a time when you could hold somebody accountable, you could sit them down and say, you're going to have to explain to the American people how you're going to build this wall, or, or what you mean by they're sending us their rapists, or mm -hmm. fill in the blank. Ted Cruz has got this voting record where all you are is against him. So Groucho Marx line, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. No. So, so yeah. what is yeah, the role I mean, of the media? Well, what we're, what we're seeing is the candidates are now increasingly in control of the storyline. You know, when Bill Clinton was president here, and he came here something like 70 times, uh, they, the White House allowed us to travel with him every time he came, uh, from the minute he landed onward. And we got to see him in all kinds of events, you know, living rooms, uh, big venues, fundraisers, whatever. It was completely open. That is not the case anymore. Uh, when Obama comes uh, as a poll reporter, you get ushered in for the three minutes where he gives the introductory speech and to the big fundraiser, and as soon as they start asking questions, the entire media gets ushered out. We don't get to hear any of the questions. And let me interject. Yeah. Carla videoed one of these things and got banned from the White House right. press pool for like a year or something. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You actually showed um, up and started I, I, reporting. I, uh, I recorded a protest that took place in the, in the audience, which about 20 people in the audience did as well with the cell phones. I said, the cell phone is the, is the whole point. They are so afraid. Of, of the, the YouTube moment, that now they they have so compacted what we do. You, you can see Donald Trump has, has banned political reporters a couple of from from uh, his events. That would never have helped, uh, you know, a generation. You, you just couldn't get away with that. Before. Reporters have been kicked off the bus before. That's not entirely new development. I think what's different is this: in his first year in office, Bill Clinton gave a speech to the. Uh, uh, radio and TV gallery in Capitol Hill. It's one of two big media dinners, the other one being the White House Correspondents Dinner that you may see on C-SPAN. And he got up and he tried to tell a joke. He thought it was funny and the audience was horrified. He said, guess what I learned last year? I don't need you people. 
<laughs> and what he was trying to make a joke of was that he had gone on Larry King and he had done talk radio around the country and guess what? He didn't need the DC fishbowl media. And he was right. And this has been the revelation with Trump and other candidates this year. I don't need to sit down and have the Washington press corps to talk to. A different train runs things. If I want to drive a message around the country, I don't go to the New York Times, I go to the Drudge Report and let that let the media chase that for a few days. However, it, and it was the New York Times interview with him on the issue of foreign policy right. uh, that, that has given him the most trouble. That is which, when when the media gets the opportunity to sit down and ask which, uh, which is why he's not the right, same why thing he can, with Sanders and the New York right. Daily News. He actually was questioned about his policies and what he's going to do and had no Answer. Yeah. So, so, and what got him in trouble was that they videotaped all that and right. put it on the internet. It, it, nobody ran out and bought the Daily News and the New York Times because that was in there. Everybody went to the website. But, but, but if you look at the Trump formula, so he doesn't need to go to a traditional news outlet to make news. He can do social media, he can let Drudge drive it. If he wants to, wants to juice his own, if he wants to do free advertising, he'll do Fox and Friends and do his hit on Fox and Friends. If he gets into trouble, he'll go to a safe harbor, which is Sean Handy or Greta Van Sustern, and make up for it. Fox has become a, a the salvation for the Trump campaign in this regard. I think one of the stories coming out of this election is that uh, the game of chicken that Fox News played with Donald Trump. And that my theory is this, Roger Ailes, who runs Fox News, thought that Trump, at the end of the day, would not run for president. He would just use this to leverage more money out of NBC to do The Apprentice. And then, lo and behold, he changes his mind and decides to run. So I think Fox News makes a calculation. Okay, he'll run for a while. He'll run for a couple of months. And once somebody else picks up immigration, he'll say, there, I've changed the course of the campaign. I'm out of here. And that didn't work. And then they thought, okay, he'll go to Iowa or New Hampshire and take a beating. And then he'll drop out. And that didn't work. And on it's gone. It's been like watching one of those slow-speed car chases through Southern California where <laughs> the car just keeps on going through rumble strip after rumble strip and it keeps going. But Trump has been able to just get around traditional media by having social media. And, but the only caveat I'd have here is that he can do this because at the end of the day, number one, he's Donald Trump and he's been playing this game for 30 years with media, be it the USFL, casinos, The Apprentice, beauty pageants, he knows how to play the media. And second, it's what I call the celebrity discount of politics. If you're Trump, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's a hell of a lot you can get away with at a politician camp because you know what? You're a celebrity. OG, isn't he cute? Yes, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And although we've, we've seen Trump, Cruz, and before them, Sarah Palin, I think, was, uh, were masters at you know pointing to the media in the back of the room and saying, see, they're not going to. I mean, at Palin rallies, people would actually turn around and throw things at us. I mean, it's like. I never tried to hit to you. <laughs> was it food? That's all I ever cared about. <laughs> Actually, the origin of that would have been after Dan Quayle was put on the ballot in uh, New Orleans. He was, became the vice presidential candidate, and the Bush campaign, after a bad reaction to that, they took him back to Indiana to do a hometown event. And the people back home were so horrified and mad at the treatment that Trump, uh, uh, Quayle had received in New Orleans that they had to literally cordon off. They put the media in essentially a cage. Yeah. And people threw things at the cage at the media at that point. So. It's like a country western bar. So that's why I always thought you remember one, point, one point somebody wanted to be able to bring firearms to the convention. Yes. And, and I thought the cost of putting up the glass wall to protect the media or not. Uh, Sal, your thoughts on this question of how the media has changed. The public has never thought media was going to help them much anyway. Uh, so may, there may be some people who think, good for Trump, he's figured out how to not to have to talk to those people. It's had a remarkable effect, obviously, as you know, we've, as everyone has, has brought up. Um, you know, in terms of a, looking at it from a campaign perspective, you know, there, there's all these elements of a campaign, and certainly the, the, the earned media is part of it. But I think what you're seeing with Trump, and we saw with Perot, is believing that that alternative media. I mean, Trump. Would, I mean, Perot used to say. Why should I spend money on TV? I'll just fly up to New York and go on the Today Show, which was the equivalent of social media in 1970 or 90, 1992. And so both Trump and Perot have no paid media. Well, that's all part of how you tell your story. Mm -hmm. You use earned media and paid media. Did I tell the, did I tell the Hal, Hal Riney thing already? No. Well, when I was down in Perot, Hal Riney was everyone knowing Hal Riney is. I mean, he's like the foremost advertising person in almost in American history. Mm -hmm. He was in San Francisco. He was he was the voice in Morning in America, the Reagan ads, 
and uh, he had a, you know, all the Fortune 500 clients. And one of his more famous ads was uh, the Subaru ad, where it looked like Monuments National Park. I don't know if it was or not, it was probably right outside the park. And they helicoptered a Subaru on top of the mountaintop. And the ad was something like, go to the top of Subaru or something like that. And they had a helicopter that was flying around that filmed the thing. It was one of the more successful ad campaigns uh, in American advertising. So we bring Hal down to, to Dallas to meet with Perot because he wants a world-class campaign. Well, Hal Reine is the world's best advertising genius. And so he was trying to pin Hal down on how much it cost to do a spot. And finally, this is 1992, Hal said $750,000 would probably be the average. And he said, well, how much did that Subaru ad cost? He said, well, that cost about $2 million. He says, you think I'm going to be stupid enough to pay somebody that puts a super on the top of a mountaintop and pay them $2 million to fly around in a helicopter? He says, you're fired. <laughs> you know? uh, and that was the end of Hal Ryan. And so he hired a guy who did the Dallas Mavericks halftime show to produce his TV spots. You know, that was his world-class campaign. But shortly thereafter, he got out of the race. <laughs> well, well, Trump is in the same way. You know, he brags he doesn't have any TV. No. Ah, what do I, I'm doing all the social media. Well, guess what your poll numbers say? You're 70% unfavorable. <laughs> you know, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get a lot of me earned media coverage, and guess what? It's all bad. Mm -hmm. You know, people conclude they don't like you anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, from a campaign perspective, you can't separate the earned media from the paid media because they go hand in hand. And what you're finding is in some of these alternative media that people think that's the game. Obama was the classic case of doing it right. He took social media to the highest level, but he also had the best TV ads too. So he mixed together the earned media and the paid media in a way to maximize the effectiveness of both. And I just say when we talk about Republicans in the media, the, the best campaign experience I've ever had was John McCain with the Straight Talk Express, where you could, we'll never see that again. Right. You, you can go with a candidate for eight hours on a bus right. and ask him anything. It was like being in the, in the best college class ever, where you could just have these incredible discussions. It got him in trouble. You won't see it again. But in some ways, it used to be, you know, when I got started, you know, you always hung out with the press. The candidate hung out. Right. You'd be always in the back of the bus. There was a lot of booze. By the time we got anywhere, everybody was pretty much <laughs> south, yeah. you know. And, but, um, no, but, but it never affected coverage. It never affected coverage. <laughs> if you could still write, you were good. Well, I can remember we were traveling with Jerry Brown. He'd get on the bus, and at one point, I remember, Started asking, would you leave us alone for a little while? We've got work to do. Because he would just, he, he really liked that sort of intellectual level of give and take. And no, no, but Jer Jerry Brown's trick is being, he's, uh, this is a very frugal guy. Uh, he'd get on the bus, the, the media would all be ordering food and eating. Oh, he'd come yeah. along and <laughs> pick at everything we ate. <laughs> he'd eat off everybody else's plate. And never but, ordered himself. But there, was, there, was, there, there, were, there was a rule that, 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 that worked in those days, and that is the press would not write anything without an understanding that they were writing. Right. So if the candidate had one drink too many, that would never be in the newspaper. I mean, it, 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 there was a trust and a confidence between the media. And so you would have candid conversations with the press and the candidate, and it would not get reported because that was the understanding. And then what happened is, as the media exploded with these kind of yeah. more oblique media outlets, you now have people that didn't play by the rules. So if somebody suddenly starts leaking something and putting it out on a website, well, yeah, with that's web, with web, with with um, apps like Periscope now, which live stream on your cell phone, there is no moment at all where the candidate cannot, uh, you know, guarantee well, well, something off the record. Well, let me ask you this, Carl. We've we've had an issue with this in the Republican race, and that's Ted Cruz and the National Enquirer stories and the allegations. Good point. How aggressive do you think the press has been with regard to Cruz as compared to Clinton or going back to probably the start of this, which would be Gary Hart back in 1987, wasn't it, when uh, yeah. Paul Taylor from the Washington the Post, business, yes. yeah, Senator, have you, you know, maybe committed adultery? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, we saw with John Edwards. I mean, <laughs> we were talking about You're this. You're right, one. though. Yeah. Cruz seems to have gotten a pass, at least in terms of the furor that was created by a National Enquirer story on Gary Hart and what's her name? Well, when I, I worked on, I, Sal worked on Ross Perot in 1992 and my, my bad convention, I worked on the Bush quail campaign in 1992. And that's not a bragging point because you go to a Bush reunion and they, you tell them we worked on the 92 campaign, they put an L on their forehead <laughs> because you're the only one that managed to lose November. 
Um, but in 92, we were bitter about a lot of things. We were bitter about Ross Pro. We were bitter about this crazy man named Pat Buchanan, who was, we haven't talked about this, but he was Donald Trump incarnate in terms of protectionism and nativism and racism and so forth. And we're also upset with the media, the scanner story in part, but also we felt that they were going very easy on Bill Clinton on his affairs. And we thought they were going easy because they had a guilt built up from the way they had handled Gary Hart four years earlier. So I guess my question is, do you think there is an even standard with politicians in their private life, or is this just kind of a swinging pendulum and we'll go yeah, back and I forth? Mean, and I don't know how to answer that. I think you may be right on that. With this Ted Cruz story, you know, we've talked about it within sort of media circles, and it's possible you haven't seen the end of it. I mean, we, we saw what, what the National Enquirer did to John Edwards and uh, didn't they do the uh, Appalachian Trail governor? Mark, Mark Sanford. Yeah, yeah it, right. Uh, so they, they have produced stories that have panned out and this one we haven't heard a whole lot of traction on but I'm, I, I know there's other people looking into that one. The question is, uh, you know, I, uh, I think it is all about um, what materials out there and what's able, uh, you know, what, what are the circumstances at the time. And, so and it maybe, is kind of maybe what are your expectations? I mean, I mean, Clinton became like every every hack comedian. All he had to do was make a Clinton sex joke, and he'd get a laugh. Um, right. mm -hmm. and, and our expectations are different for him, <laughs> certainly, than they are for Cruz, I suppose, and especially for Trump. I mean, the guy's been married several times and had affairs with the women he eventually married while he was still married to someone else. Uh, I mean, I've never seen a candidate talk before about how hot his daughter is. It's a very strange uh, sort of a thing. Let's go ahead. I, I was just going to make the comment. Um, you know, we may be inoculated somewhat to these kinds of stories that it's not a surprise um, when these kinds of things come out. I think the issue, though, is the other inquirer stories like the John Edwards um, affair was picked up eventually by the mainstream media yeah. because it was happening. It was true. Yeah. I, I don't know that there we're, we're at that point on the cruise thing. I mean, who knows if it's true or not? But it hasn't. There hasn't been additional information come to light. If there is, and it's uh, uh, legitimized by what, and I still think there is a mainstream media. Uh, I'll still, I still believe that. Uh, then that takes it to yet another level, and I think it probably still would be something of an issue. I mean, yeah. at some point, I think the public will be. Kind of inoculated will become I, I a little did, bit more. It would like be an issue with him because of his evangelical appeal. Right. Uh, right. It would be, you know, seen as hypocritical. I mean, I, I think all the barriers have just so come down. I mean, yeah. in 1980, 1964, when Goldwater, I think, you know, beat Rockefeller in California, I forgot what happened. His new wife, Happy, yep. had a baby. I think it right happened right before the primary, and everybody said the fact that he was divorced was the killer. That we would never elect a divorced man as president. That was 1964. We didn't elect a divorced man as president until Ronald Reagan in 1980. Uh, in, in New Orleans in 1992, I guess, yeah, the Republican convention, I made a complete fool of myself doing interviews saying that nobody with all the illicit affairs of a Bill Clinton could possibly be elected president. <laughs> and, you know, we're willing to tolerate a lot of things, but we're not going to take somebody who's, you know, it's just indiscriminate in their affairs. Well, why was I totally wrong? I mean, and and I think it depends right. on the candidate, as we saw with Arnold. It's uh, you know, Arnold. The, the, the LA Times stories came out documenting all kinds of groping. You know. And there was more heat on the LA Times but than there was more on, heat on but the it's LA also, Times. But it's also what the public is really willing to settle with, what they're comfortable with at the end of the day. And with Clinton, they made their peace. We've talked about this before. There was a wonderful skit on Saturday Night Live right before Clinton took in the White House. And the late Phil Hartman was playing Clinton at the time. And it shows him running into a McDonald's on his jogging detail. And he's going around like Bill Clinton. He's eating everybody's food. And he's offering things like that. And the Secret Service agent turns to Clinton. He goes, he goes, uh, Mr. President, you know, Mr. President, Mrs. Clinton told us not to let you in here. And he turns to the agent and he goes, boys, there are going to be a lot of things we're not telling Mrs. Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> but you trust Saturday Night Live to kind of understand what the public is thinking, and that's what the public is thinking. Okay, the guy, the guy is a rake, the guy is a hound, but we think he can do the job. And they thought that he really did care about the issues that were yeah. affecting people. We're almost out of time. I'd like to go around one more time and ask, are we going to look back on this year as a, as a watershed year where politics changed fundamentally? Or is this going to be an anomalous year and, or, and things get back to normal? I might as well start with you, Bill, since it's a really difficult academic question and you're smarter than the rest of us. 
No, I, uh, I, I really am kind of averse to using the phrase watershed elections. I, uh, there are occasionally important historical elections, 1980, 1932, but watershed, no, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Kevin. So I'll go ahead and take the opposite. I think it is a watershed election. Uh, I think it is going to, um, in retrospect, we'll look back at um, something of a political realignment uh, within the Republican Party and um, to some degree the Democratic Party as well. So I think this will wind up being a fairly status quo election in terms of who we elect and I think it probably will be Hillary Clinton which is as establishment as you can get. But in terms of the political process, the parties, the dominating process, some, some of the underlying dynamics of how politics and partisan politics is run, I think we are seeing a dramatic uh, uh, evolution here. So. I, I think, you know, every presidential cycle kind of moves down the road a little bit further. I don't think this is going to be different uh, in that, you know, we'll learn some things. Social media is going to play a bigger role, probably. Sex exploits are going to be even less important in four years from now than they were this time. But I don't think it's going to be a, a watershed election. I think the next time it's going to be a watershed election is going to be when you find a candidate that's going to be a unifier. Uh, and we change the mix. I mean, I, I was somewhat, somewhat critical of Karl Rove in the Bush campaign in 2004. When I worked for Kemp, you know, Jack's thing was Republicans can't avoid the cities. We keep abandoning the cities. And so, you know, he always had an urban agenda. One of the few Republicans did. I mean, Rand Paul and Marco Rubio, two candidates that are kind of descendants of Kemp in that regard, and both of them do a lot of, did, did a lot of things for, to have an urban policy. Um, the 2004 campaign, which, you know, Carl was elected to re-elect George Bush. That was his job. Did a good job. Re-elected him. So, you know, he gets an A. But what he did do is he reconfigured what the Republican national majority was. And so not only did we abandon the cities, but we abandoned the suburbs. And from 2004 onward, the Republican Party became the party of rural California and small town America. Now that's works great for the Congress, but it makes it as the numbers you two were playing with, find 270 electoral votes that way. It's very difficult. Like the Democrats are like almost a lock for about 240. Uh, that means you've got to win all the states that Republicans normally win, and then you've got to win, you have to sweep all the competitive races. It's an inside straight. It's very difficult for Republicans today, the way we've reconfigured the party, to win a national election. The Trump thing was interesting for a while, I thought, because he broke the Rove model. And he was getting people that normally don't fit in the Republican constituency to support Republican candidates. Uh, unfortunately, that's all blown up. So there was, a, there was a good thing that what Trump was doing, he was changing the dynamics of how the two national parties aligned themselves, but, you know, God, it's gotten into so much controversy, it's kind of long lost. But I don't think it's, we're going to have a watershed election until we find someone who bridges what we now have as the divide. And I don't, I saw some, I thought Rubio was a candidate who could do that, I thought Rand Paul could definitely do that. Uh, but I don't see any of the candidates that are running c that can do that. And I, and I think the biggest change to watch in this election is the diversity of voices we're seeing that are having an impact on this race and how that's going to go forward, particularly in the Republican Party, away from older white voters. And we've now seen African American vote have a huge uh, sort of voice in terms of issues, Latino voters. And we've seen, we're seeing this here in California, we've seen it here for a long time. Asian American voters, and I think um, that's going to be the interesting thing to watch in terms of how candidates and the parties deal with this going forward. I also, I think, just the ripple effect on if it's a Donald Trump campaign, what happens in lower in the in the down ticket, and how that affects um, the Republican Party all across the country. Now, that's something to watch. Too. Uh, I do think the one thing that's changed is the machinery of campaigns has been changed dramatically. It may not have the kind of watershed effect on the outcome this year. But Obama certainly changed the whole thing with how he used social media uh, the first two, two, two times he ran. Yeah. That may be changing again. Um, and, and that's maybe one of the reasons it's so unsettled, because the machinery isn't the way it used to be. And people are still trying to figure out how to develop a, 
how do you develop a comprehensive national message in the absence of a national mass media? Ladies and gentlemen, um, the folks here, obviously, some of them are really geeks about this stuff when they're spending their time crunching the numbers. Um, but we all, um, I, I think, I, I've known all of these people for a long, long time. Uh, and I can attest to a couple of things. One is their fundamental patriotism and their love of our country and our system. And please join me in thanking them for taking their time to be with us. Well, thank you very much to our panelists this morning. Thank you, Mark. I want to thank our uh, morning session sponsor, Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital, for this morning's session. Thank you, Bill. And of course, thank you to Carol Groom, Roseanne Faust, and Kevin Mullen uh, for serving as co-chairs for this year's progress seminar. And thanks to all the committee members, all the committee members that helped uh, on the planning as well. Uh, and of course, a great shout out, and I'd like everybody to give a nice uh, thank you to our cha wonderful chamber staff, Amy, Nina, Carolina, and even our new hire, Ben Elliott, for all the hard work this weekend. <laughs> and thank you again to Lenny's and Ted and Comcast as our signature sponsor for the weekend. Thank you. And we really appreciate your continued support. And finally, thank all of you uh, for attending this year's seminar. It was a fantastic event. I hope you had a great time. And we will see you next year at the 48th Progress Seminar, April 21st through 23rd. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. For more video on the 2016 Progress Seminar, go to pantv.tv slash videos slash specials slash progress seminar.